It's uh, my pleasure to be with you tonight and let me add my welcome to that that you've received from the Rector. Uh, I too am a graduate of the University of New South Wales, both places, which is here and in Kensington. And I have to say that the debt of gratitude I feel to the University, I think, is partly expressed uh, in the joy I have being here and working uh, not just in the academy, but with the wider community that we seek to engage here uh, in defence. Uh, and I think uh, other scholarly colleagues have got converging interests. We are very encouraged by your interest and presence this afternoon, because if it had just been me and Dean, we would have thought, enrolments might be a big thing. <laughs> but your presence here really is important, because like anything, when you toil the way on a subject, you think that it's important and you think that other people ought to hear about it, that you've taken the time to be with us means a great deal to us. So please just don't think that uh, being here uh, is something that we don't take uh, seriously, we do. In fact, without engaging with other people, why would we do what we do? Can I now ask our conversation panel members if they take their place in the warm seats, whether you make them hot, we'll find out. <laughs> if they come and take their seats here and let me introduce the next part of our program this evening, which is a conversation. Now it's true, isn't it, that each of us lives with our own thoughts and our own convictions. And we approach questions and shape answers in the light of our own life's experiences and the decisions we make about how we act are to some degree derived by the values and virtues we've acquired from a range of disparate sources. Whenever I speak to people about the things that they believe, it's not so much I want to know what they believe, it's where those things came from. And that's often a very interesting conversation. It seems to me, though, that we don't think about moral precepts in a vacuum. We don't arrive at ethical principles alone or unaided. No, conversation is critical, critical, I think, in shaping our vision of the world and discerning our place within it. So what we think we believe is revised and refined by the ideas and the insights that we gain from interacting with people who see the world a little differently because their life's journey has taken them across different terrain to different places. So what might seem perfectly acceptable to me seems utterly unacceptable to someone else. What I might regard as truth or wisdom, another person might consider falsehood or folly. So I think it's actually difficult, if not impossible, to do ethics without the company of others. The challenge though, the challenge, is to find the best companions. So we have assembled for you this evening a panel of very able travel guides. I want you to see them as travel guides, which I hope will help to broaden and deepen our grasp of the issues arising from the use and the non-use, the non-use of uh, force in the conduct of human affairs. Now as you've heard, Senator Peter Wish Wilson is Greens, Senator for Tasmania, and an alumnus of UNSW Canberra. And we really are honoured that he has agreed to be part of this conversation. And I'm saying, and I would say for myself, personally grateful to Peter for his goodwill and support. Joining the Senator are three contributors to the book that we've just launched. Rhiannon Nielsen has recently completed a master's program at UNSW Canberra with a particular interest in genocide prevention. Dr. Ned Dobos is lecturer in ethics within the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at UNSW Canberra with publications in professional ethics and political violence. And Associate Professor Clinton Fernandez lectures in international relations and strategy also here at UNSW Canberra. Widely known, very widely known for his expertise on East Timorese affairs. He is in fact a former army officer who has never been convicted of a military offence that he didn't manage to have quashed on appeal. <laughs> <laughs> Emphasis on on appeal. Now the format is very straightforward. I'll begin the conversation by asking each panellist some questions. I'll then invite them to ask questions of each other before I open the conversation to all of you. Now, can I suggest to you the aim is to ask the right question to elicit the best perspective to achieve the most insightful answer. Because tonight, as much as we are able, we're embracing the Franciscan dictum 
that it's better to understand others before you assert the need for you to be understood yourself. Therefore, success is measured in gaining a better appreciation of the other person's point of view. You might like it, but you better appreciate where it comes from and what it means to them. So, Senator Wish Wilson, let me begin with you. We've just watched a brief video on the just war tradition. So let me ask you, is a just war in today's world really possible? And a second question, politics is said to be the art of the possible, making compromise almost unavoidable. So when it comes to political management of military force, something that you have the responsibility for, can you actually stand firm on your ethical principles when it comes to the use of military force, or do you actually have to make compromises with things that you value because you represent the public whose views on some of these things are very often quite unknown? Over to you. Thanks, Tom. Um, look, I might start with the second question first because I think it feeds into my answer on the first one. Um, if, you, if you look at, I mean, von Clausewitz's basic assumption that war's an extension of political means, uh, we have this debate, and we've had it recently, about uh, the deployment of our, our ADF, whether the deployment should be, uh, the decision for the deployment should come from Parliament or whether it should come from the executive. Because at the moment, uh, under the Westminster system, our executive actually uh, sends our, uh, our defence force personnel off to, to, to war. So we've always argued strongly that um, the initial deployment and after that it should go to the executive because you can't, you can't have parliament making decisions on military operations. But the initial deployment, as it is in many countries around the world, should be made by parliament uh, for many reasons uh, because uh, parliamentarians have to get on record uh, their reasons for deploying uh, our young men and women and some older men and women, I must say, too. Uh, and, and that's there for posterity. Um, but also because Parliament is democracy and my party has different views on the use of um, um, the armed services than uh, other parties do and that's the way we can actually get all our our views on, a broad ranging views on the use of military force and ethics uh, and bring that together. So that that's to us is a really important thing. Uh, so would you, would you like to have both Houses of par Parliament sitting together and a majority, simple or otherwise, of that group? Is that the kind of model that you would want to Th authorise right. mandate the use of force abroad? That's correct. So debating and, 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 and voting. And I think if you look back on the Iraq deployment, um, going back in uh, 2003, it probably wouldn't have got through Parliament if it had, been, if it had gone to a vote yet the executive made that decision. So I think that gives you an example of where Parliament could have made a different decision. Uh, and uh, A just uh, war? Yeah, a just war. So I, I think, um, yes, uh, I've, I've given this some thought and it was very, very interesting to have the, the parameters of this clarified by that early video. Look, um, I think if you go back into evolution, I mean, depending how you define war, of course, but it's simple survival. Uh, and I think now in a more complex uh, world, um, self-defence is, 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 is a justification for, for war. I, I don't think that can be avoided. And I do believe that, in, and it was very interesting to think about the motives. Um, I think motives for my party, and we are a party of peace and non-violence. However, uh, we do support the use of military force for humanitarian reasons. Uh, we did support it, uh, the deployment of our, our, our ADF to East Timor, uh, to Rwanda, uh, and my party in Germany, which held the balance of power, the Greens in Germany, supported intervention in, in Bosnia. So um, there are situations where, yes, we do believe there is justification for the use of military force. Um, but in terms of the motive around humanitarian uh, needs versus perhaps resources and other things, we, I find it's a lot more problematic to actually say it's a just war. And I would probably argue that uh, the Iraq war, in my opinion, isn't a just war um, for many reasons. So it's pretty hard to do it in a few minutes. But uh, yes, I do believe there is, there is a case of just war. And I'd also like to just say that warfare now with stateless actors, what the state was mentioned there, of course, as being an important thing in the history of warfare, but now we seem to be in a perpetual state of war with uh, terrorist groups and other organisations, and it's a lot more complicated. Yeah. And I have views on that as well. 
Good. Uh, let me come to you, Rhiannon Nielsen. After reading your chapter in the book on perfidy and being reminded of that line uttered by Martin Sheen's character, Captain Willard, in the Vietnam War movie Apocalypse Now, charging anyone with murder in this place is like handing out speeding tickets at the Indy 500. Can I ask you, is it really, can, is it realistic to insist on the rules of civilised conduct when nations decide to engage in armed conflict? Can anyone really be trusted, given what's at stake? Thanks, Tom. I, I think that the quote that you just said reminds me of an excerpt out of Brecht's Mother Courage, which is a little bit more extent, existentialist and absurd, like war can be a lot of the time. But I think that it is very possible and very realistic to insist on the rules of armed conflict. And I think that trust, especially, is the bedrock of warfare. And I know that that can seem really counterintuitive, but failing to insist on the rules of conduct and failing to trust that the adversary would abide by those rules would see devastating consequences for both combatant, uh, combatants and civilians in armed conflict, not only in the conduct of war, but also for the end of war. If we think of a case where the law of armed conflict has been desecrated, good faith and trust between combatants has been completely violated, things like armistice, uh, ceasefires, negotiations, and even the end of war itself can be pretty inconceivable when you've got that lack of trust. So in warfare where we don't have trust between combatants, I think we start to tread the very fine line between whether we have to inflict total defeat on the other side or suffer it ourselves. So, so civilization is collapsing around us, but we still have to trust. Uh, absolutely, and if we can't trust each other and the adversary, then we essentially descend into a bloodshedding barbarism, in my opinion. Can I ask you, Ned Dobos, I note that sections 17 and 18 of the book, both written by you, are titled Pacifism and Realism. Now, is it realistic for anyone to be a consistent, conscientious pacifist in today's world? I mean, isn't the use of just a little bit of force unavoidable if justice is to prevail. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, so pacifism in its most recognisable form is this absolute principled condemnation of all violence. And a lot of people find that difficult to swallow, like you do. Um, uh, because most people think that there surely there are conceivable circumstances under which it's OK to use violence, most obviously in self-defence. Uh, if people are coming over to kill and maim us, then surely we can use uh, violence to repel them. But modern, most modern day pacifists are prepared to accept that. But then they add that most wars aren't fought to prevent people from killing and maiming us. Most wars these days are fought to protect vague political interests, such as our political sovereignty, our territorial integrity, our democratic institutions, and so on. A lot of our wars are fought to protect our economic interests. There was a, an American philosopher who said recently, uh, we used to fight for national survival, now we fight so that we can gas up our SUVs at a comfortable price. So modern day pacifists are likely to agree with just war theorists in that war can be justified if it's proportional and if there's a just cause. However, in the real world, war is invariably disproportional and doesn't have a just cause. Um, so while war can in theory be justified, as a matter of fact, it never is. So you use the word consistency. I think a pacifist would respond by saying that if you consistently apply all of our considered ethical judgments and principles, you can't escape the conclusion that mass organized killing and maiming for political reasons is unethical. So on that view, pacifists are the only people that are consistent. I think I've just received a very handy lecture. <laughs> Finally to you, Clinton Fernandez, you've been deeply involved in East Timorese affairs for many years, and you've written the section of the book on responsibility to protect. So let me ask you, can nations ever really subdue their self-interest and act out of genuine compassion to help a neighbour? In uh, principle, uh, there's nothing problematic about that, sure. In theory, it would happen. Uh, but I think the evidence is that the international system is an amoral system, and uh, states exist to
to maximize power, violence, and organize uh, resources. And so states don't act morally or immorally, they act amorally. They reflect uh, domestic considerations and so on. Uh, you talk about, you mentioned my connection with Timor. Well, uh, today is the 12th of November, and by coincidence, um, it's the anniversary of the Santa Cruz massacre. It's a massacre for about 271 uh, children uh, as they were walking from church to uh, the cemetery. Uh, at the time, um, the <coughs> foreign minister of Australia said that, uh, that he doesn't want to see any, uh, any punitive measures taken against Indonesia. The foreign minister of Australia then is Gareth Evans, and today he's reinvented himself as a big advocate for the responsibility to protect. Uh, so one can't help being a bit skeptical uh, about his, uh, you know, his commitment to, to protect. Is the responsibility to protect something more than a pretext for invasion? Okay. If it is, uh, then we know from the UNICEF um, that um, six million children uh, die of uh, preventable diseases um, every year. And uh, from the Lancet, which is the uh, premier medical journal in the world, their lives could be saved for the cost of $1.23 per life. I don't see too many responsibly to protect advocates arguing for that. So I'm a bit skeptical about that. Um, and. Uh, Given Dean's uh, uh, point about the difference between intention and motive, I think there have been um, responsibility to protect successful actions. Okay? The most obvious one, of course, is the one that ended the 1970s, and that's when Vietnam invaded Cambodia in order to uh, end the reign of uh, the Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot. Well, we know how we responded to that by encouraging China to invade Vietnam as punishment and by recognizing uh, the Khmer Rouge's seat of the United Nations General Assembly uh, for the next decade. Uh, and the, the, that, that's the end of the 70s. The uh, 70s began with another R2P, which is uh, the Indian invasion of East Pakistan uh, to end the genocide there and to create the nation of Bangladesh. Well, the US sent the Seventh Fleet into the Bay of Bengal uh, to threaten the Indians after that. So uh, I'm a bit skeptical about... Um, what about Bougainville and the Solomon Islands in Australia? Are they instances where we acted to protect and we were genuine in our desire to do that? The uh, uh, existence of the Panguna mine uh, might have had something to do with that. Um, and our long-standing interest in uh, ensuring that the Northern Shield, which is uh, half the island of New Guinea, uh, remains under um, a friendly government. I've had a chance to ask you questions. Now, Clinton, would you like to ask a question of one of your fellow panellists? Sure. Um, I've written not just that chapter on R2P. There's another chapter I wrote on autonomous weapons, which is, let's change the subject for a second. Um, and in that chapter, um, I argue that, in fact, autonomous weapons, or even, let's take non-autonomous, but unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, they are actually possibly a very ethical way of striking. Because unlike a human actor, a drone, uh, can hover above for days at a time, is not scared of anything, doesn't need to uh, you know, make human, uh, human mistakes. Um, and the target can be selected uh, with great precision. And so casualties with drone strikes are actually less likely, to, uh, civilian casualties are, are less likely, they happen, but they are less likely than if you attacked uh, using human actors. Can drone strikes be ethical? Um, given that uh, they are being used to, uh, you know, what, what targeting requirements are needed uh, to make drone strikes ethical? Well, it, it depends on what kind of ethical system you want to apply here. So there's an ethical system that applies to criminal justice, and then there's an ethical system that applies to military conflict, and they're radically different. Okay, so depending on whether or not you, whether you see a, a drone strike as a uh, an act of law enforcement or an act of war, that will determine which ethical principles need to be followed right. here. So if you look at it as an act of law enforcement, then you need something approximating due process. Yep. However, if you apply the principles of war, I mean, if, if you're a soldier on the battlefield and you see someone that you reasonably believe is an enemy combatant threatening you, you don't need to apprehend that person and put them through due process. The laws of war allow you to to neutralize that target, right? So the, the same requirements do not apply there. And so if we're applying the rules of criminal justice, then we need some due process. If we're pro applying the, the ethics of armed conflict, 
then it's really no different from killing people with pistols or with missiles. There's nothing morally distinct about drones. It's just another sure. piece of hardware. But it seems, it seems that on the, you know, it's the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta and one of the key found principles that it, it documented enunciated was due process. And uh, aren't we just depriving people of the right to life uh, only by debating things in the executive branch rather than actual uh, evidence? Absolutely, we're depriving people of the right to life, but that's what warfare does. And if we're applying, if we're applying the principles of military ethics, then the consensus seems to be that there are circumstances under which you can deprive people of the right to life without going through due process, namely the circumstances of war. Yeah. So I think the, the inclination to think that there's something wrong going on here with these drone strikes is perhaps to, to be looking at these strikes as instances of law enforcement rather than of war. And that's perhaps a legitimate move to make. A lot of people had that intuition uh, after the, bin, the, the killing of bin Laden. You know, a lot of people thought, shouldn't they have captured him and brought him in and uh, shouldn't he have faced trial and so on and so forth. But that, what that reveals is that people aren't quite sure which paradigm to fit these things into. Is it law enforcement or is it Thank warfare? You. And that's partly a political kind of consideration. Peter, do you have something to add on this? Yeah, just quickly, and it's a really good, it's a really good question and it's, it, it's hard to find an exact answer, but I think what worries me about uh, drones and the um, the detachment that comes with a lot of this kind of warfare is is it is dehumanising more. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, um, but when you have someone a long way away who's not actually there, who is still killing people, uh, I worry about that level of detachment. And ha is it, if there's anyone in the room who hasn't seen the video collateral murder, which WikiLeaks posted. Uh, during the Iraq war it was one of the most troubling things I've seen uh, where it wasn't a drone but nevertheless it was someone at a distance saying you know, light them up uh, and then the ambulance arrived and they lit that up too and had a child in it and it's bloody awful I mean that's the kind of thing that is happening as well so it's a, it's a very vexed question but I will just warn that that detachment that dehumanization uh, also comes at a cost. Ned, question for others perhaps. So my questions for Rhiannon uh, we hear a, a lot about the responsibility to protect, which is ca cl classified as a responsibility of the international community. And that seems to be a very nebulous concept, the international community. I know you've done some research on this. Can you tell us when people say that the, res the international community has a responsibility for this, that, or the other, what do they mean? Uh, who exactly does that responsibility fall to? Great, thanks Ned. Um, this definitely ties into something that Clinton was talking about and yeah, R2P definitely lights a fire in my interest and I think one of the things that people forget about is that the first pillar of R2P as we understand it and it has gone through three different evolutions uh, since its initial inception but the responsibility to protect lies first and foremost with the state. So it's not a pretense at least in the first instance for bigger states to essentially put up their hands and say, hey, let's go into this nation. The idea is that the state itself has a responsibility to protect first and foremost their civilians against the big four, so genocide, ethnic cleansing, um, mass systematic rape, war crimes. Um, in terms of the international community, if a state is manifestly failing or unwilling to execute the duties for their civilians, then the international community has a responsibility to step in. Typically that's understood, at least in the UN, and that's typically the platform upon which people approach with the UN Security Council, to discharge this responsibility. Now, even if the UN doesn't do anything, and as we can see, at least in the last 20th century, it's not very good at doing very much. It often gets into a stalemate. That doesn't mean that states in the international system are exempted from those responsibilities, nor does it take away from the responsibility of the state, first and foremost, in which these mass atrocities are occurring. So what happens is that a coalition of the willing is formed, and that the states who join the coalition of the willing are responsible for the R2P execution. Yep. And Rihanna, your question for your fellow panellists. So mine draws on the work as well that Clinton was talking about. If we have this understanding that institutions do have a moral responsibility to respond to mass atrocities, if they're failing in executing that, and we have seen a lot of failures, especially over the last couple of decades, do you think that institutions can betray? Do you think that that's a concept that we can apply to states? Uh, I don't know if 
institutions have souls. I know that policymakers within them do. Uh, uh, but this betrayal, as you call it, which is an appropriate term, isn't just for the more pyrotechnical sides of things like in Syria or wherever else there's a stalemate. I mean, it, is, it also is for the 6.3 million children that die of preventable diseases every year. Um, and uh, until, until I see uh, ways in which that uh, problem, uh, which is easily preventable, uh, gets solved, uh, I would remain a skeptic, uh, a skeptic about the, the R2P process. Now, can the international community act? I think this reflects domestic power structures. Um, you know, it would require taxing uh, people, wealthy people, wealthy institutions, in order to generate the funds necessary uh, to, to save those lives. Um, and so until those internal uh, problems are, or obstacles are resolved, I don't think there is any, any support for it. Mm -hmm. And Peter, your question to finish with. Yeah, my question is, um, some of the evidence we heard in the Senate inquiry I, I referenced earlier was that some defence personnel had been uh, sent into active <coughs> service for over eight years. And I, um, my question is about the length of wars. Uh, we seem to, as I mentioned earlier, we seem to be in a perpetual state of war, um, uh, what Peter Gresta called the uh, appallingly named War on Terror. Um, that seems to um, seems to have no end and no no. Uh, well, my question is, um, how easily politicised now is war? Uh, it seemed to me that in previous uh, significant wars there was very clear objectives. It was mentioned earlier, but how easily politicised is war? And have you seen any examples of what you see are clear examples of it recently? Of politicised war in Australia. Um, it's quite normal, I think, for, for policymakers to justify what they're doing um, on the grounds of, of benevolence and so on. And in that case, I guess political, uh, they, they would expect political um, benefits to accrue to them. I'm not sure I fully understand uh, what were your question, though. I'm just, just wondering if, in your observations, have you seen politicization of war yes. recently? And given that it's, it's always there, I mean, I'll give you, give you an example. Um, it was reported that our, our previous Prime Minister said that he wanted, the, he wanted our Super Hornets to drop their first bombs before the Canning by-election. Uh, it was a week before that, the by-election that they committed I to see. their bombing raids in Syria. That gives you an example. Uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know, it was reported. We did ask in the Senate that exact question. Um, is this a worry that we see uh, long periods of warfare and different, different parliaments coming and going? Yeah, I, I, obviously I don't know the details on that. I mean, all I read was what's in the papers. Um, uh, for, the, for the most part, though, I would say that, uh, that the politics is something that these are exceptions uh, to try and, and get personal or you know, party political benefits. Uh, and if it did occur, I, I would assume and I would hope uh, that there would be a leak uh, from inside the Defence Department exposing uh, the misuse and the manipulation of the Australian Defence Force for uh, what are essentially sectional interests. Uh, if that is the case, then yes, that would be politicisation of it, sure. Someone did leak it. Right. That, that, that example I gave you. I mean, I think that would be in order to protect the integrity of the Australian Defence Force and to preserve its, its political neutrality, uh, that would be very, very concerning and I would hope that there would be a, uh, exposure of that. Let's come to your questions. Perhaps if you'd like to raise a hand, we'll bring a microphone to you. If you'd like to ask a question. And our friend over here, very helpfully on the aisle, will start with you. Thank you. <coughs> Microphone, uh, Chris Wilson, class of 05. Um, we've recently seen international condemn condemnation of Australia's border control policies based on an ethical or moral framework. So my question, hopefully piques the interest of the, of the panel, is uh, should another's view on the ethical value of decisions, based on, as Tom said earlier, their insights and experiences, should that affect the local decision-making process? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely it should. Um, I mean, this is obviously the, the, the key balance in this argument is, is the need to actually be harsh on people for deterrence value. That's the argument that you need to be cruel to be kind. Uh, and the, and the, the enemy is people smugglers. Uh, it's, uh, there's no reference given in the language used around the individuals and the human beings that are caught up in this kind of operation. Um, but my party's view has been very clear that um, they, 
these the ethical issues that we face uh, with putting, uh, for example, children in detention uh, is is getting back to the the heart of what what you what you said a little bit earlier about uh, you know we you have to sometimes make absolute. Uh, value judgments, and and there are, and this is an example where we do believe that there are lit, there are lines in the sand that have been crossed, and it reflects very badly on us as a nation. Uh, and um, there's, it's not a, it's once again it's a complex subject, but yes, I, I think ethical considerations as decision, we make the decisions in Parliament that lead to these policies, uh, and um, once again there's a lot of politics involved in this, unfortunately, that's what's sometimes good for political parties. Um, but yes, ethical consideration is absolutely critical. Thanks for your question. Mark Warren, just across here. I'd just like to follow up the uh, my own question uh, to our president of ethics. Uh, the, in your response, you talked about um, differentiating between uh, uh, police operations and you know, warfare operations. And I, your response led me thinking that it actually may be difficult to discern what's going on there because in the, your other example you gave of a real life person actually seeing a target and neutralising it, uh, there their situation is clearly under threat. But in a drone strike, it's not necessarily clear who's under threat and what needs to happen. It, is there an ethical problem there where people are just slipping into the warfare mode when in fact it's actually a, a police action? Um, sure. In the example that I gave, you might say that there's an imminent threat to the soldier, but there need not be, right? I mean, if we think about neutralising uh, targets with long-range missiles, the same thing applies. If a judgment is made by military personnel that this is a legitimate target, you can neutralise the legitimate target. Again, you do not need to go around apprehending everybody in that compound or in that building in order to bring them before, <coughs> the, before the court. So it's not so much a matter of slipping from law enforcement to war. It's more a case of a war has been declared and now we're just going to classify every act of killing therein as part of the war paradigm. Right? Now a lot of people will say that is a, an ethically peculiar attitude to have. Usually when we're talking about killing, when we're talking about something with such moral gravity, we should insist upon something a little bit more rigorous, something like due process or you know, uh, the presumption of innocence and so on and so forth. Uh, but if that's the attitude you want to take, well, this comes back to my, my earlier comment, uh, a lot of people see that as a path to pacifism, right? If that's true, then warfare as we know it is never acceptable because warfare as we know it invariably involves killing and maiming people without the due process that you find in the court of law. Desmond Woods. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, and thank you, panel. Um, I was intrigued to come in and see the video which was on uh, Gulf War I, and I agree that USAID Bellum can be applied to the strategic intention which was to restore Q8 to sovereignty. However, there's a difference between strategic intention and the actual process of carrying that out. I was a British Army officer with BOR in 1990, and I was posted on General Sir Rupert Smith's staff to Gulf War I. And the morning of the highway of hell, I was on it. The wheels were still turning. Uh, there was still a lot of death and dying going on around me. Uh, what had happened is the A-10s had come in, hit the front of the convoy, hit the tankers, uh, with all the uh, Iraqi uh, civilians and others fleeing from Kuwait City. Then they hit the back of it uh, so that nothing could, could move. Then they went up and down, strafing, uh, including, and I can eyewitness this, individuals who had got out of vehicles had been cut down. Many of the people there were, as Norman Schwarzkopf characterised them, thugs and rapists and murderers who had been terrorising Q8 for the previous six months. So the question? Some weren't. Um, the question is strategic intention as opposed to tactical solution. Uh, you can have a just strategic intention, but the way in which you carry it out can be anything but just. Your thoughts? That's the turkey, commonly known as a turkey shoot now, right? That situation. Yes. 
So that's something that top on what we were watching with the video is just ad bellum with the three first principles which are typically associated with deontology. What you're talking about here is absolutely just as important and it's called just in bello and they're the just and ethical principles that we need to abide by in the ethical conduct of war. Now Michael Walter has been a really big forefront in this area and he's recently come under scrutiny and people have said you can't disassociate the two concepts going to war and the conduct in war and inseparable. But I think that what you're definitely alluding to is that while you can actually find something that satisfies the first six principles of Yusad Bellin, in Yusin Bello it comes out as a different story and you can potentially reflect on the war overall as whether it was just or not. But thank you. Perhaps time for two more. Question here, thank you. Just wait till we get the microphone if we can. I'm, I'm sufficient to We can just, it's easy for us to, to get you on record. <laughs> um, yes, so this is a, a something of a Machiavellian question in one respect, um, but it's for the Senator Wish Wilson. Um, uh, given current conflicts, which have been described as wars of ideals, so one particular set of ideals against another set of ideals, um, where justification is particularly important, not just for political reasons, but also for fighting it, and the consequences of these wars uh, that we're increasingly seeing, things like PTSD, things like moral injury, um, and chronic injuries, injuries, closed head injuries, these types of things that last for the rest of the injured person's life. Do you see a greater role for what, generally speaking, is a dirty word in public policy, which is a theorist? Do you see a greater role for these people, given the nature of these conflicts, in future policy making? Did you say theorist? Yeah. Could you explain what you mean by theorist? One who is not a practitioner, or has not in the past been a practitioner. In terms of dealing with PTSD? In terms of dealing with PTSD, in terms of fighting an armed conflict, in terms of... Do you mean a civilian? Yeah, well, generally, people in these, in these spaces, yes. I guess I am categorizing this to civilian policymakers as opposed to military policymakers. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, it comes down to, obviously, the structures within, within defense and, and, and DVA and, and how they're fun funneled through the political process. Um, it's a really difficult question to answer, actually. Um, I would have thought that the expertise is quite important. Um, but we are looking, for example, with PTSD, we are looking at a whole different array of, of treatments that would be non-traditional, like um, gardening, for example, and working with animals. And it's worked really, it's been very effective. Um, so that's, and that's come from people say, applying uh, innovative solutions, like you see in a lot of things. So yes, I'd say there's definitely a role for uh, perhaps non-military um, expertise in that, in that kind of situation, but... Um, Let me turn the question around. Do you think there should be more ex-military people in Parliament? <laughs> ex-military people in Parliament? Well, that's um, maybe creeping up on the same thing as our friend is asking. In other words, that do we need more specialists, more ex-operators in Parliament who are parliamentarians? Why not have the Minister being someone who's got 20 years service in the Army? Would that be better or worse? Now you'd say it's the individual, I know, but as a principle. Yeah, look, well, look, I think it is. I think once you become part of a political machine, that you're tied to that machine. So um, there, there, there are there are more people from the, the ex defence forces going into the into the military at the moment. Sorry, into the into parliament. Um, I don't think it really matters. I think it comes down to the individual integrity of the person. That's that's. I know that sounds like what you just said, Tom, but. Uh, I actually think it just comes down to the integrity of the person. Uh, I think if you go and speak to some senior ranking military officials, they'll probably tell you they wish they had a defence minister uh, who had uh, that background and experience. And their biggest issue is actually the turnover, the political process. As parties come and go, as leaderships come and go, um, we've seen, as you're all very aware, we've seen uh, four leadership changes in uh, three years in Australian Parliament, and with those leadership changes come changes to the portfolio allocation. So it must drive um, experts who are dealing with PTSD who need funding all the way through to key decision makers on procurement and uh, and you know, 
decisions on active conflict must drive them mad that there's that much turnover. Yeah, because the contrast, because after the Second World War, for 25 years, all the service ministers were ex-service people in a service other than the one they served in. Uh, the ministers were slightly different. And then we went through a period in the 90s where there was almost no, other than Graham Edwards, I think, very few ex-service people in Parliament. And now we've noticed the numbers increased and a few people have said to us, it would be a good seminar for us to have here to talk to people who were service people now in politics. Why did they go into politics? what party and what particular things do they think they bring to the process. Our final question is from uh, Tom, who's just there. There will be time, of course, here to talk to our panellists after uh, our gathering here, but we'll make this one the last question. Thank you. Oh, there you are, sorry. <coughs> right. um, it's a quick question just to try and bring it back down towards the practitioners of war and the soldier. So war is generally comes down to the soldier, the soldier conducts war, and those soldiers are generally quite young particularly the sharp end uh, and education levels, etc. Um, my question for the panel is, as we move into a type of warfare that is quite different to what we sometimes experience in the past, how do we better prepare our soldiers for the, the ethical dilemmas they can face in the way of those levels? And linked to that, uh, there's a couple of controversial cases in the UK that have been about so the charges of murder uh, and the application of law uh, inside uh, warfare. Um, what, to what level can we disaggregate responsibility from our soldiers in war? Should we give them sympathy in war? Can we apply the law on them? Does that make sense? It's an open question. Ned, would you like to start? Uh, just uh, on the last point you made, should we uh, be more sympathetic towards soldiers that let's say commit war crimes or that would do something that would be much more frowned upon in civilian society? Uh, I think most people would, most <coughs> ethicists would say Yes, in a lot of circumstances, because we often draw a distinction between uh, the justification for an action, so is it right or wrong, and then whether an action is excused, so is it blameworthy or is it not blameworthy. So we can consistently say, and I think most military ethicists would say, if somebody kills an innocent civilian um, without taking the right precautions, that person's done something that's unjustified. However, that's not necessarily to say that we should condemn them, we should blame them, we should chastise them, and so on and so forth, because you might say any person in reasonably similar circumstances may well have acted in a similar fashion given the irresistible impulse for self-preservation, and so on and so forth. So when you hear military ethicists talking about war crimes and condemning the killing of innocent civilians, uh, that should be interpreted as what's happening here is wrong. This should not happen. It's not necessarily to say that we ought to lynch the person that, that did it. There's a, a separate judgment to make there beyond justification. Even if, the, even if the act was not justified, there's still the separate question of whether it might be excused or whether it might not be blameworthy given the circumstances in which the person found themselves. So one's different to a hundred? Correct. <coughs> Whatever that means. Well, in other words, that, that you might excuse someone if it's a, another person, but if it's Rusty Kelly at Me Lai, you'd say no. Well, n not necessarily. I mean, there may be circumstances under which an act is neither justified nor excused. So you did the wrong thing, and furthermore, there are no extenuating circumstances here, so we should also blame you for it. But I'm saying sometimes these two things come apart. Sometimes we can say, a person did the wrong thing. However, given the circumstances in which they found themselves, we really shouldn't judge them too harshly. So you'd rather judge each case on its own merits exactly than make right. a general principle statement. Correct. Do you want to come back on that point, Rhiannon? And then we'll come to the first one on preparing people, which was the beginning of Tom's question. So just to follow up, and I think both of these are kind of linked with what Ned was saying, but you were talking about training our young people to be prepared to go off into warfare. And I think that where you're sitting right now, UNSW Canberra at ADFA, is such a testament to that. I did international relations in my undergrad grad at a civilian university, but sitting in a lecture theatre, surrounded by people in military uniforms training to be officers, they need to know this stuff because when it comes to push and shove, they need to make the right decision. And I think when we're talking about culpability and holding people responsible, you mentioned an ethical dilemma. An ethical dilemma is distinct from a test of integrity. And an ethical dilemma, I think if we've got a situation where somebody at the spear front made a decision, they didn't know what the right choice was, we need to look at that in a different light 
compared to where they do something and they know what the right thing was to do and they chose otherwise. So pretty much all officers know that you can't indiscriminately kill civilians. That's something that we should more harshly frown upon versus I didn't know whether to do X or Y because I don't know what the ethical correct thing to do is. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, from what little I've seen on moral injury so far, it's not necessarily they're doing something unethical. It may be that they're actually doing their job. And we heard some very compelling evidence of a soldier who was collecting a body of someone he'd shot and happened to put his, it's all a matter of public record, happened to put his hand accidentally into the bullet hole. And that triggered uh, quite a severe uh, PTSD issue later on. Uh, and he relates it to his sexual life now and his impotent and all this sort of thing. So I don't think it's necessarily the fact that he he felt that he was it was a war crime or anything. It was actually his job. So it's a lot more. I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And it differs from person to person. There's no there's no individual uh, like it, depending on your trait. Some people don't suffer at all from it. So it's it's quite a complicated thing. And what about the training? Yeah, I mean, uh, you've never been found guilty of anything not on appeal. No. <laughs> not, nothing like that. No. Uh, I think for the most part the system and the training works. Um, such war crimes as are committed are aberrations. They're definitely not uh, uh, not 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 normal. Um, clear orders. You know, orders for opening fire. The off-off cards. Clear orders is the best way to prevent uh, or to, to provide the soldier with exactly what he or she needs uh, to shoot or not to shoot. Secondly, and probably as important, is um, mental toughness uh, on the part of the defense chiefs uh, to not be caught up and be hypersensitive to whatever outrage, gotcha uh, effect of the media uh, is. Uh, to hold your nerve and wait for the procession to pass, because it will. Uh, the, the culture of uh, you know naming and shaming and having this outrage why everybody sort of uh, points the finger and the you know the, the defense chief sometimes say oh well you know something has to be done let's just hang somebody I think they need to show a bit more leadership and a lack of hypersensitivity uh, to whatever uh, outrage of the day is. So the core of this for you is the leadership issue. If you look at one thing that you would say that would support soldiers' operations with issues. Leadership in which they yeah, the, the training should be simple. So that's the first point. Simple orders, clearly understood orders, uh, so that the, the people on the battlefield, uh, you know, don't have to come through a major kind of algorithm before they decide to shoot. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, but if a war crime occurs, then deal with it through normal process, uh, and not just you know bend with the wind. Please stop that there. Thank you for your questions on that. Um, thanks, thanks very much, Tom. Um, I'm, uh, uh, as an engineer, I'm uh, uh, sitting here thinking that uh, there's been a lot of criticism in uh, politics in Australia of research in the humanities, and I think what we've witnessed here this evening is a, a perfect illustration that research in the humanities actually does matter, and it's not just something which is, uh, which, which, which is es uh, some, uh, es esoteric. Um, I, um, uh, I, I, I guess that people also want to justify research in the humanities as being culturally important, um, and we can have that discussion afterwards perhaps, but I think there's a lot of things that go on that really do matter. They are about uh, who we are as a nation um, and uh, uh, how we uh, wish we should be acting. And uh, so I want to uh, do two things in, in closing. The first is, if everyone would join with me in thanking our panellists, uh, Peter and <laughs> Thank you.